Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. President and First Lady. My name is Alois Novak, and I am Rector of the University of Warsaw. And I am honored and privileged to welcome you, sir, here at Warsaw University. We are more than happy that you decided to come to see the University of Warsaw and the students in particular. I have to say, and I want to say, that the cooperation, the research cooperation and teaching cooperation with Finnish universities has been developing in a very, uh, very good way. We have been having many Finnish students at our faculties and many of Polish students, students of Warsaw University, are willing to go to study at uh, Finnish universities. I personally also had a chance to teach for six weeks or seven weeks at Helsinki Business School some time ago, and I was extremely happy to be there. I had a chance to cooperate with Finnish colleagues so, uh, as we know, as we talk on the way from Bristol to the University of Warsaw, to some extent, we have also a similar history. You were only probably more lucky because at a certain period of time you could speak Finnish and we were spoken at the time in Russian. But anyway, when you look at the buildings here in Warsaw, at Warsaw University, if you look at the buildings, and streets in Helsinki at least and some other place, places so we see some similarities. Students are extremely happy as far as I know because they have a chance, they will have a chance to listen to you, to ask some questions and we are extremely privileged and happy as well because Finland is the country which are showing us from time to time or all the time how to, how to be good perceived, how to develop research, how to develop techniques, etc. And Nokia for a long time was with us, and not only Nokia, but also Finnish culture, also the relationships, also, I would say, the very positive approach to human beings. I mean, you are probably the most open nation and the most friendly nation, minimum in Europe, but I would say, uh, you know, in the world, maybe people similar to you with your openness you can find in the Midwest, in the Midwest, in the States. So uh, there is a chance also to say thank you for everything you have been doing for a long time. I mean, opening the doors of the universities, opening your society, opening your culture and techniques, and we, for a long time we could use all these possibilities, studying in Finland, working in Finland, and enjoying life and cooperation with Finnish people. Just now, situation is slightly different. We are in European Union. We made a huge development, so many countries are opening the doors for us, but it was time during what the Scandinavian countries and Finland is one of them were opening. So I wanted to say thank you for everything you did for us. And I am expecting that the future is promising, that you will be visiting us, you, first lady, your colleagues, but also professors, students, and we will be developing further. Thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you for giving us the possibility to be together. And uh, the floor, sir, is yours. As we understand, you will give, it's up to you, but you will give short speech and then maybe students will be asking the questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you for everything. Your Excellency, Rector Novak, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me start by actually quoting you 
in exact words, you said that you are the friendliest nation in the world. I repeat it, you are. Uh, what I mean by that is that our visit here has been excellent. We have uh, enjoyed every moment, learned a lot, and surely it's always very important to meet friends who think in a very similar way. And in the world as it now is, we really need like-minded friends and partners. Uh, I thought uh, for the students, uh, take up only two more general uh, issues. Uh, we can go to any details with your questions, but uh, shuts, uh, in a way, directions for the future which uh, you will face and uh, where we try to help you give answers. Okay, it's uh, global power politics. First, uh, let's go immediately to East uh, and uh, Russia. 2015 or somewhere there, I noticed uh, that President Val <coughs> Putin gave a speech in Valdai he gives a yearly speech. And in that speech, he opened up his thinking by telling that the Western people, us, are weak, heroistic, egocentric, degenerated, and thus West is weak. Uh, during my meetings with him, I think that uh, uh, the right conclusion is that he really meant what he said. He thinks that the West and Western people are weak. They are too good. They are used to too good. And thus, they <clears throat> are not able to give a response. It's a very dangerous thinking if uh, somebody with powers and uh, willingness to show the powers is thinking that somebody is weak, that's not a very good message. So, is the West weak? Ukrainians showed that they are not weak. You have showed by supporting Ukraine, that you're not weak. We have shown it too. Uh, but um, nevertheless, I think that uh, there's room for improvement. Why I always uh, feel myself delighted when I meet uh, Polish people is that I know that the basic attitude amongst our citizens, individuals, is very similar. It has been measured many times in polls. When asked whether you are willing to defend your country, Finns more than 70% answer yes. In Poland, it's almost similar. But in some European countries, it might be only 15%. <clears throat> this maybe sounds a bit harsh, but uh, what we see taking place demands now also very profound thinking, even hard one. Because I believe that you can't be good without giving a straight, strong answer to bad. That's how the world is built. So, the other direction I would like to take up is even more global. Uh, we all have uh, heard uh, news how the BRICS cooperation is uh, once again 
up to date. I noticed it some 15 years ago already while I was working in a banking system. Then it was maybe more financial efforts that uh, uh, BRICS led by China tried to do. The idea was uh, to uh, fight or at least reduce the impact of dollar as a <coughs> currency resource. It was a failure then, but now we see again BRICS countries, five of them, telling that they have uh, more than 40 different nations eager or interested at least to join the BRICS club. That's uh, quite a amount of, of nations. And if you look nations which are named, you can count that uh, they represent uh, some, well, approximately six billion people. Uh, what we represent with our Western heritage, if you count everybody and exaggerate a bit, you might find two billion. So that's the basic uh, position. Uh, two weeks ago, there was another meeting uh, Muslim countries in uh, Saudi Arabia had a meeting. Uh, there were also very uh, major nations, by population at least, represented. Why I take this up, we used to say, and you have heard it many times, that actually those countries have not that much in common, nor the BRICS countries, India, China, nor the Muslim countries. They really don't have anything, almost anything in common. And thus, you shouldn't care that much about it. Okay, I'm sure they do not have very much in common. They have different uh, interests. But they have one thing in common, and that was said very clearly in a Muslim meeting, also by the BRICS. And it's a feeling that uh, the West is, in a way, controlling the world, and uh, that uh, that time should be changed. Uh, <clears throat> I don't mean anything radical, anything revolutionary, but we have to keep in mind that there are feelings, global feelings, which don't accept the <clears throat> everything that uh, has been uh, taken place and what everything, what the West represents. They say that the uh, World Organization, even UN, is a product of the West and uh, that means that uh, it should be somehow changed. When we look at the future, let's say one decade, two decades, when, uh, when you there uh, take the responsibilities, uh, it might well appear that uh, we who have learned to show places to others will have our, our place showed by others. And that is why I emphasize the need of equal discussions globally. I have visited uh, Africa I know many European colleagues are doing that in the same time. There, <coughs> we do not have any impossible fences between us, but they will grow if we stay passive and if we only rely on the history of uh, stro the strong West. Uh, 
these uh, two lines uh, maybe uh, are worth thinking and uh, discussing because, like I said, uh, in your future you will face them. And uh, my generation's uh, major task is to try to start soften these kind of uh, different elements which are growing. So, ladies and uh, gentlemen, it was uh, very nice to hear the rector's uh, comments on, uh, on Finland, on your cooperation on universities. That's most important. I heard that uh, students here represent uh, 70 different uh, nations. That gives uh, a huge possibility in itself already to improve <coughs> uh, the <coughs> understanding of each other's. Basically, we people are not very different. Basically, if we try to be friends with each other, we find each other's. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, uh, thank you so much for sharing with us your insightful and profound thoughts. Uh, we have a lot of students here, I see, from the Faculty of uh, Political Science and International Relations, so I'm sure you're going to have lots of interesting questions. President Ninisto has graciously accepted to take some Q&As. I'll tell you a little bit. I'm sure you've done your research, but apart from having a long uh, career as a politician from Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Justice, uh, Speaker of the Parliament, obviously 12th President of the uh, Republic of Finland. There are certain things that are very similar be between the President and our Rector. Uh, rector is actually a President also of uh, Academic Sports Association, and I know that you used to be a uh, President of your football association and, and figure skating. I read somewhere that President had escaped tsunami, I think it was in Thailand. So I think this is probably military. Uh, military uh, uh, exercises that probably came in to help at that time. But um, I will take questions, quick, few quick rules. We ask a question, it's not a statement. And then please don't do a follow-up questions as, as we normally do. And then I will look at the president as he chooses to, uh, to, uh, to point to the per persons that like to ask a first question. So the floor is open. Do I have a first hand? I am from Tampere, actually. And uh, I have studied at this great university, and now I work at the Museum of University to preserve its traditions and history. My question is based on the first part of your speech. You told us that Finnish and Polish are quite similar, and I, I share the feeling. How do you think we could even more improve the cultural and economic relations between these two nations? Okay. Flying from Helsinki, to Warsaw takes only 1.5 hours. So actually we are very nearby to each other. What uh, we have seen, cruel luckily things taking place in Europe, that uh, automatically brings us closer to each other. And uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, understanding well, I can talk of my own experiences. Understanding has increased uh, enormously. Usually it takes place when people or nations find out difficulties, common difficulties, they unite. But um, <clears throat> surely this kind of level is not at all enough. I was very delighted to hear about the cooperation between universities. That's very important. And uh, you should not forget here in Poland that uh, Santa Claus is living in Finland and he very <laughs> much likes to meet people before Christmas. So uh, visiting tourists and uh, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, the Finns know very well, uh, surely beautiful Warsaw, but uh, for example, Krakow is... Uh, very, very popular.
popular on Finnish tourism. And tourism is not uh, only having a fun time, because you learn a lot, and that's why we uh, ordinary people, tourists, they learn a lot and they understand more and more each other, the more they meet. Thank you. <clears throat> Next hand. Uh, I'm uh, a student of international relations here, and I have a very particular question because of uh, what is going on on the eastern border of uh, Finland nowadays. The same thing that was going on here uh, two years ago on uh, the border between Poland and Belarus. Uh, you talked about the fact that uh, the European Union uh, must uh, change some of its policies because everyone who is coming here, uh, the moment that they arrive, they can uh, become asylum. You cannot send them back. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, about your possible plans. Uh, what could you do to uh, make European Union uh, to change its policies? What are your possible plans? Thank you. <clears throat> We faced uh, the same phenomenon in 2015. Then some thousand uh, uh, migrants uh, came over our eastern border and uh, it was very obvious that the Russian authorities helped them to enter. I was then already thinking that uh, uh, we should be brave enough to start discussing whether the Geneva uh, Agreement from 1951 and later on uh, human rights uh, uh, agreements, whether during those <coughs> agreements were made, uh, it was understood that uh, migration might change its nature. I mean, mass migration orchestrated by uh, by a state, hostile state, uh, people used even as you know, kind of human weapons. And on the other hand, what we have found out is that deportation of those people who have no reason to seek a refugee, refugee status, they don't have, they don't meet the criteria. But it is almost impossible to deport them because, uh, for example, Russia doesn't take back anybody who has uh, once stepped out of Russia. So, <clears throat> the basic element is that whether we are, are courageous enough to have an open discussion on what, on those agreements. That's, that was my point of view already 2015. Yes, now <clears throat> we face similar phenomena like you did a couple of years ago and maybe still going on in Latvia. It has started again. And uh, it, it is really a difficult problem because you have to all the time to keep in mind that they are human beings, individuals, some of them suffer, you should help them, but uh, if the amount of people is massive, uh, you endanger your own nation's security. I had a possibility of visiting Germany last week and I understood that uh, Germany is going to tighten its uh, regulation on refugees and uh, reduce the benefits of refugees. But still I understand that even in Germany, uh, they very well understand that it's not, question is not only German borders, but European Union borders. And uh, I fully agree that European Union should uh, find all the possible means. It's not only us, it's also Italy, uh, where refugees are coming in big amounts. And uh, like I said, this is a very, very difficult uh, issue because you have, on the other hand, the human rights, which we want to respect, and uh, we want to help those in need. But on the other hand, as misused, it's weakening our societies. 
uh, it's a complex, complex thing to get closer. But uh, I think that there are now more and more willing will to have an open European discussion and trying to get uh, further in safeguarding Europe and European Union. Great, thank you. Next question. Uh, my name is Agnieszka Homańska. I'm a program director and analyst at Visegrad Insight Respublica and a researcher and final IR student here at Warsaw University. I have very short two questions. The first, what the EU can learn from Finland in terms of collective defense? And a second, uh, with regards to Granada Declaration and uh, the shaping of the future uh, European uh, strategy, can Finnish defense culture help develop new EU standards, especially when we are talking about uh, sovereign Europe and when we have Finland in NATO? I Thank you. Can you answer the first one, and then we ask a second question again? And you wanted to hear what you can learn from Finland. Well, yes. surely we hope that a lot. But um, we had uh, some moments of time with the rector to talk about uh, history and found out that um, we have a lot of similarities in our history. So maybe you don't <laughs> learn that much about Finnish history. But um, uh, if I describe you a bit uh, the Finnish social circumstances and how they have been developing. So um, Finland used to be a very poor country before up to Second World War. But uh, after that uh, uh, for example, my parents and many other parents thought that if I want my child to have better than I, I will educate him and her. And uh, the respect of education was high. Respect of teachers was high. Respect of knowledge to do how, how to do things was high and still is. And I, I think that's the key word for Finnish success, respecting education. And the word respect is most important here because we learn if we respect. We do things which we respect. And what I'm a bit worried in Finland when we hear, for example, teachers telling that uh, they don't necessarily feel themselves anymore that respected. So, so Agnieszka, yeah. uh, you broke our rule of one question at a time, but we let it slide. Can you just restate the question about the national uh, defense on Finland? Because we didn't hear that It's clearly. a bit echo here, so I have a, hope you just hear me. I understand. But, uh, um, it was about the influence of the Finnish defense culture on the future of European security agenda. Okay. Uh, that's a uh, very Finnish uh, phenomenon that we have maintained conscription. That means that uh, every boy, uh, well, uh, finally approximately 70% of them will uh, do their service in army. Girls can on voluntary basis and it's increasing all the time also attend the same um, uh, training uh, that has been very valuable i tell you one story about my own town time i came from countryside a small city and uh, we were put uh, with other boys uh, some of them from capital Helsinki, to same room, 20 of us, and being woken up at 6 o'clock in the morning, got to sleep, sleeping 10 in the evening, and all the day long, very tough training. It took approximately a week that a boy from Helsinki, very handsome, studying uh, judicial um, faculty, and uh, hardly never 
being outside Helsinki, which was, uh, in his opinion, the whole world, suddenly said that, well, I'm astonished. You look and you behave like human beings to us. So, not only uh, training, learning uh, military skills, but a social cohesion is maybe even more important. Youngsters from very, very di different uh, circumstances learn to know each other, learn to maybe respect each other. And uh, it's uh, such an experience that uh, I know that many, many youngsters continue connection to their friends in army the rest of their lives. And uh, I, I would say that this is one of the major elements that uh, one should uh, learn from Finland. I know uh, I met your president already um, six years ago. He visited Helsinki and was very, very interested on in our conscription. Thank you. I see there is already a person uh, in the back standing, so please go ahead. Yes. I have a question about this. What restrictions and actions will be taken in connection with the migration crisis on the eastern border? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Maybe I first uh, tell a bit about Finnish uh, southern border. I, I'm sure you have heard about uh, how um, pipeline, Baltic connector was broken and some of the cables also in underwater. Uh, that uh, case has been now studied. Uh, we have a good cooperation with the Chinese uh, officials uh, and uh, it seems that uh, uh, the captain of a Chinese vessel has a lot to explain when he arrives to China. But uh, that for that. What we are new, doing now in uh, the eastern borderline is that we have uh, closed uh, the southernmost crossings, four of them, if I remember correctly. And uh, now the discussion, <coughs> you know, the movement uh, which came from south southern crossings changed to more north, north uh, for the open ones. And uh, I guess the government, I guess, uh, the government is now planning whether they close up more and more uh, also the northern crossings. The final problem we are facing is that uh, we have noticed that Russian uh, border uh, guards are pushing people are pushing people uh, to uh, can I call it no man's land in between the official uh, borders and then closing their uh, doors. That means that they don't take back anybody. They succeed to push further. And uh, people are uh, well eager to, most of them eager to come to Finland because uh, it's not only shelter, for many it's also uh, better circumstances, living circumstances. What we do is that uh, we try to tell uh, we are social media worldwide and especially in those, those countries where we find people coming that the Finnish borders are not open so that uh, they wouldn't uh, think that it's an easy way something like this we are doing. Okay, thank you. There was a question right here in the front, the gentleman in the middle. Go ahead, please. So, much is being said about the change in the situation, military situation of Finland after the accession to NATO, but I wonder if it would have other consequences, for example, in the economic sphere of uh, Finnish policy and uh, yeah, how it would impact other spheres of Finnish policy. Thank you. Yes, um, 
First of all, I want to warmly once again thank uh, Poland for a strong, strong support for our NATO membership. I know you did, uh, you did hear a lot uh, also to convince some colleagues to understand the need. Um, yes, how I see the NATO <coughs> membership is uh, uh, that uh, the main thing is preventive cover we get. And that's the most important. But otherwise we, and uh, in my opinion all the partners, should understand that it doesn't stop your own obligations and your own need to be as active as you can in uh, developing your defense. And that's what we are doing. We are not giving up at all. So it's not in a way a shelter where you can start smiling and having a, a restful time. But it is most important. What uh, comes to economy mm, and uh, trading and such questions, I don't see a very clear link between our NATO membership and uh, economical activities. Uh, and uh, according to my knowledge, there are no concrete, no uh, major concrete signs of that. Not at least yet. Uh, Mr. President, I'm uh, Shimon. I'm a student of international relations at the Faculty of uh, Political Science and International Studies. Uh, in your lecture, you spoke about us students in the future. On the one hand, you mentioned the dangers connected with the Russian aggression, like new proposals in BRICS, for example. On the other hand, you said that people from the Excuse me, we lost you. Could you just uh, repeat that again uh, when you... Yeah. Uh, in, your, in your lecture, Mr. I'm President... I'm keeping again the... Yeah. In your lecture, you spoke about us students in the future. On the one hand, you mentioned the dangers connected with the Russian aggression, like new proposals in BRICS, for example. On the other hand, you said that people from different countries should work, work together. Don't you think it is inconsistent? People who come to the university from other countries have their beliefs, and today's world, the authorities don't often work together against dangers. What we as students should do to live in a familiar world? Thank you. <clears throat> what has happened in Europe when Russia made its cruel attack to Ukraine, something shuts happened that uh, it was, uh, well, not at all expected. What we have learned to live in peace for after the <clears throat> Cold War ended, uh, it was a shock. And um, that's why one of the elements has been to close the doors to Russia. Politically, yes. Uh, what about uh, cooperating or um, in a very different areas which have no, nothing to do with the warfare or, uh, or hostile behavior? Uh, that would, uh, in a way, be uh, coming back to normal. And uh, so far, the clear maturity is thinking that uh, coming back to normal is not necessarily, uh, not partly accepting Russia's activities, but nevertheless, in a way, forgiving them something. Uh, and uh, I would be quite uh, careful to uh, start uh, uh, a deeper cooperation in uh, in any major areas. That's a sad story, but uh, then we have to look why we have 
this sad story in front of us. And that's not us to blame. Uh, what does the government of Finland is doing um, to further enhance the education system and what strategies um, does the Finland yeah. implementing to maintain it? Yes, I'm not uh, actually an expert to answer this. I have to repeat myself by saying that what I consider is important is that we maintain our respect to knowledge and uh, creating uh, circumstances uh, and uh, opinions towards that is uh, actually uh, my thinking and what I try to achieve. Uh, surely what comes to education in uh, details or in larger scale, that's uh, more for the government to do. Okay, <clears throat> so I think we, we're talking about, just as this meeting about educational endeavors, international educational endeavors and, and international cooperation, such as this meeting as well right now. Great, next, yep. next question. Uh, Lady right here in a blue standing, yes. To the, to, yeah. Herr Presidenti, uh, thank you very much for letting me uh, to talk. I have a question regarding Baltics and Finnish policy regarding Baltics as the situation is very changed, especially after the incident near the Estonia border. Uh, how uh, do you picture the strategy regarding this region? Will there be a shift in the role of Finland in contact with those countries? Uh, like I said, the situation changed when we became a NATO member. And uh, I repeat that uh, I consider that the most important thing is the preventive cover that uh, we get from NATO. Surely we are uh, fully working alongside NATO partners and doing whatever our membership uh, demands. Uh, and in the same time, keeping in mind that at the end, the basic responsibility for Finnish uh, security still is on our own shoulders. But uh, surely, uh, being able to rely that partners will help if needed. But uh, I would say that uh, the most important element is NATO, in NATO is that uh, if it makes the preventive cover, actually all the other possibilities uh, useless. That means that uh, preventive cover is enough like it has been so far. So my question is, in a rapidly changing global landscape, what role do you see in multilateral diplomacy and institutions in uh, shaping security policies? And how can Europe contribute in fostering international cooperation? Thank you. How Europe should... Uh, can you say OK? R role of diplomacy? Uh, yeah. And <coughs> and During uh, almost... Uh, all my time uh, as president, even earlier on, I have uh, tried to enhance European Union to create uh, uh, or to become stronger together than what it is. That uh, has meant, in my opinion, defense cooperation, which is not away from NATO, but strengthening uh, the European <coughs> Uh, European uh, input in NATO. And uh, I think that this hasn't been taken very seriously. If we remember history and uh, all kind of unions that uh, nations have created, almost uh, every time the first thing has been security. That's why we need a an union. And uh, I'm not convinced whether European Union has as its first task to guarantee security of uh, uh, nations and individuals inside Union. 
it's understandable because uh, the times like we have seen after Cold War ended were very peaceful. But at least now it is time to enhance the knowledge of uh, uh, importance of security, not only in military uh, means, but uh, like we have discussed here, uh, the migration situation also endangers uh, if uh, we can't find an answer to that. So I would uh, develop Europe to that direction and the uh, role of diplomacy is one of the elements you strengthen your security. Thank you. I think in your, in your opening remark, you also said something very interesting when it comes to diplomacy, that as a principle, we don't always have to start with a no. Mm. Mr. President, before I give a farewell word to our host, Professor Alois Novak, our rector university, to come, I just wanted to thank all of you for coming here. I want to thank the Finnish delegation for working with us uh, and also our, um, our, my team. Uh, this was a lovely meeting. Thank you so much. And uh, Rector, please, a final farewell. Thank you so much and thank you all. Mr. President, thank you for being with us. Thank you for giving this excellent speech and the answers. And I'm absolutely sure after your visit that the things will be developing properly between our countries and between the universities. And I appreciate very much what you said concerning respect and what is concerning education, knowledge, and things like that, because I am absolutely also convinced that universities has, have much to, to do and that the teachers, but also students, must be also respected in the future of exchanges of the students, faculty members, and knowledge is very important, and uh, I fully respect that and I absolutely agree and I am absolutely also sure that also the exchange programs of professors, of faculty members, students will be developing and we have much to do something in common. Thank you for coming. We wish you all the best in professional life, in personal life, and please come again. And as the students said earlier, and I am sure they respect you very much, you, you could become one of the professors at Warsaw University where you have time. We will ar arrange the financial resources to invite you and to be one of us. Thank you very much. Hi. <clears throat> I want, I want to thank you. It has been a great uh, experience for me to meet you and to all the students here. For the students, I just created a new thing, <laughs> thought. Mm, start to respect everything you learn, so you learn more. Thank you.